If you're like me, you see this album for sale at the holidays and you wonder, gee, is that a fake or not a fake? Well, this is not a fake. Uh, there's many fakes out there. This came out in March of 71, actually, to tell members of the Beatles fan club, look, there's going to be no more Christmas flexi discs because every Christmas they would put out a Christmas message flexi disc. Sometimes they'd get them in the U.S., sometimes they wouldn't, but they did it every year from 63 to 69. This was a much more durable, easy to listen to way than hauling those things out, assuming you even had them all. Uh, the president of their fan club, I mean the secretary of their fan club, saved one copy of each, apparently, and um, that's how they mastered this so it sounds decent but not spectacular in 2018 they put out a box set recreating all the fan club flexies on vinyl that's sought after but it's not as valuable or i think cool as this uh, and there's a british version of this album that's completely different looking but we won't get into that so uh if you want to see if you've got a fake of this first of all see where it says theater royale above john and paul's heads that will be too washed out to read if this is a fake, because the artwork they used was a little uh, blurry and obviously not an original negative. One of Ringo's eyes in one of these photos has like a big black circle around it or on it, if this is a fake, because again, it didn't reproduce properly. This slick that has been pasted onto the back here will not be a slick on fake ones. They would have just printed this and this on either sides of cardboard and folded it all together if it's a fake. If it's a fake, this diameter, this ring here, will either be non-existent or a different diameter. You'll see a little shadow of the spindle hole of the label they originally photographed to get this, and it'll be a little washed out or a little blurry if this is a fake. And then one of the most telling things, because a lot of them get it, all this pretty right. See, there's a Winchester rifle symbol. That's what that is for the Winchester plant, the capital owned, and bell sound. You probably won't have both of those if you've got a fake. But either way, it's enjoyable, so have fun with it. If you're like me, even though you had a this, you had to have this. This box set came out in 2018. The first time that these Beatles Christmas uh, 45s have come out on actual vinyl. They used to be on those uh, flexible flexi discs, and they would be put inside of their annual newsletter in Great Britain. A lot of times in America, we would get sort of a facsimile of these or a postcard with something looking like this. We wouldn't get the actual... Uh, content, whether it was music or a voice or, or both, that they did every year um, until Americans didn't get to hear all seven of them until they got this album in 1970. But from 63 to 69 in Great Britain, they got the flexi disc versions of these. Uh, when this came out in 2018, I think it was selling for about $75. It seems extremely reasonable considering these things had been out of print since 1970 and never really officially released except through the fan club. Um, and now that set goes for, I think, about $200, so I kind of wish I had bought more than one of these. But uh, it's beautifully done. They did a really nice job, nice uh, jackets that sort of um, recreate everything. The discs, I only opened two of them. I don't even know why I opened them when I've got the LP. But the sound quality is pretty good of these, a little bit better than the LP in some cases. Uh, and as you can see, these are from the various years. This booklet recreates the actual newsletter issues that these uh, originally would have come with on, again, flexible uh, material, flexi discs, not vinyl. Then it comes in this nice box you got right here. This is uh, the sticker, the hype sticker that was on mine. I decided to save that. But these are very cool because, you know, it's a side of the Beatles we don't often get to see, uh, or rather hear. And um, these were oftentimes recorded uh, like at the end of a recording session in the early days, and they're kind of tired. Then later they got really, really produced, and Kenny Everett, the genius DJ, would edit them together. So if you can find this set for a good price, I would get it. You'll enjoy it, and uh, it's very cool looking. If you're like me, you find this cover a little creepier than the original for this album when it was called A Christmas Gift for You on Phil Spector's Phil Less Records, however you want to pronounce it. That came out in 63. Uh, it was not real popular at the time. It came out the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated, but uh, it's grown in stature ever since. And some of us, you know all these songs, Darlene Love, The Ronettes, everybody. We hear these uh, every Christmas season, every holiday season, quite enjoyable on the radio. Uh, after about a decade, uh, he decided, you know what, I want this album back in print. He was friends with John Lennon, George Harrison, so he got it out on Apple Records. And Clive Arrowsmith and John Kosh collaborated on the sleeve because um, they did a lot of Beatle projects, so they were the, the people to go to. 
So as you can see, recording first published 1963. You see that in a lot of British and European stuff. Um, so this was back in print, and they even had his special back to mono slogan pin on him and stuff. That is Phil Spector hiding under there. Kind of looks sinister even then. Um, and I bought this copy in North Carolina when I was visiting one time. But anyhow, uh, mid-70s, this goes out of print yet again. So he decides I want to just use the same artwork and everything and put it out on my new label with Warner Brothers. Phil Spector, or it's called Warner Spector. There's the label on that one. And it's pretty much identical, except they added, see down here, they've got this uh, blurb. Down here it says Authentic Mono on this one. Other than that's the same, and the weird thing is, this is not mono. Very few stereo Phil Spector productions have ever leaked out. I don't know why this exists. I don't know what this master tape was doing existing. Um, it's a little weird stereo at times, but it is technically stereo. Different things in both channels, or in, in each channel. And uh, it's not mono, which is uh, very unusual for his productions. So it's kind of a curio, kind of an oddity. Um, and it sounds decent, and it's always going to be enjoyable because the music is so great. But if you're looking for a different experience with this one, search this out. If you're like me, you're constantly tripping over this album in the dollar bins and you ignore it. But uh, I wouldn't do that if I was you, actually. Uh, this album came out, this particular version came out in the mid-70s. This is not Elvis's Christmas album exactly that you might know from 1957. That one looked like this, and that one was a huge seller at the time. A few years later, that one went out of print, and uh, then they brought it back with this cover. All right, fine, not a big deal. I guess they wanted to sell a few more copies with a new cover. Nothing wrong with that. And then... Eventually, it went to this cover around 1970. I don't know why. I mean, the, the background's similar, but I don't know why they decided that uh, his jacket that he wore in a still from Speedway, a movie about racing, was Christmassy. Maybe because it was green. I don't know. This version and this version have the same track list in that they take eight of the songs from the original 1957 album, and then they removed the remaining four songs from that album, which were uh, more religious, and they'd been recorded earlier in 1957, not later like the rest of the album. Uh, so they removed those four songs, and to this they added Mama Like the Roses, which is from his early 1969 sessions that were his comeback, and they had uh, Suspicious Minds and uh, In the Ghetto, all of those songs. And then the other song was um, If Every Day Was Like Christmas. This was a single in 1966. Uh, that did, you know, so-so, as most Elvis records in 66 were not doing great. So they took those two songs and added them in place of those four more religious songs from the 1957 album. Uh, so your short two songs on this, but it still flows pretty well. It's a decent album. This version, you know, they took the cover, again, him on Speedway, just airbrushed it and circled it with this somewhat more festive-looking thing. They put it out on the budget Pickwick label. And this did all right for a long time. After he passed, passed away, this was one of the ones that stayed in print and was kind of a big seller. So that's why you see so many of them today. But if it's in good shape, pick it up. You'll enjoy it. If you're like me, you might not be thinking, wait, this isn't a Christmassy album. Well, it came out of Christmas 1967. The original title was Cosmic Christmas, which I feel like better than the actual title, Their Satanic Majesty's Request. Nonetheless, Working backwards, these three pressings are a little different. This is the mono reissued in 2016 in the Rolling Stones and Mono box set. This is the mono original American, and you can notice right away this has got the lenticular 3D cover. This does not, but actually looks more sinister here. However, this washed out color on the reissue does not look so sinister. And also on the back, you'll notice they've zoomed this way in compared to this. And this one's got uh, washed out colors. So take your pick. The, the disc itself, though, on this reissue looks and sounds phenomenal. So I highly recommend that if you can get your hands on one. This is the American original, which, again, red label. And this is the American stereo. The jacket for the American stereo, identical to the mono, except for down here, you know, it says stereo. But here's the thing. I swore monos in America had, well, stereos in America, we know, have blue label, red inner sleeve. I swore that monos had red label, blue inner sleeve, but I haven't been able to find any confirmation of that. So maybe I was just dreaming that up. I guess they all had red inner sleeves like this in America. And in Britain, uh, they had that or maybe just a white one. I don't know. But one thing I learned in researching this, originally this was a dedicated stereo mix, dedicated mono. After this first pressing, they just mixed down the stereo to mono, 
And the way to tell in the matrix, it'll say 8127-T2. That's a fold down. You don't want that. You want 8127-anything else. And you also listen at the beginning of the lantern. If there's three bells, that's an original mono. Two bells, that's just a fold down from stereo. Still cool, but not as sought after as this. If you're like me, you will not be listening to these albums ever, but they're still interesting looking. Um, these are on Pickwick, the budget label, which we all know and love. Uh, and it's a bunch of Christmas favorites done in like a disco theme. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I guess these came out back to back because there's the number of 1026 and then 1027. Uh, both, I believe, from 1979. Yes, right there, 1979. And they're both performed by something called Mirror Image, which must be a bunch of just studio musicians. I don't know. It says Disco Dance Step Lesson and Close. Mine does not have that. And in fact, the vinyl for these I put aside before making this video, and I don't know where I put it now. So <laughs> I'll find it at some point. But uh, back then, disco was everything, and that's why they made stuff like this. You can go online and hear samples of this. You might enjoy it. You might not. Kind of in a Muzak way, Muzak vein, you, you might enjoy it. Also, I got to say this... Is this the same lady in both? I don't know. Uh, these at one time were apparently quite sought after, and I guess the ironic 70s disco train has uh, left the station, so that's not really the case anymore. I am looking at these song selections, and I don't see any duplication, so I guess we've got uh, two full programs of pretty amazing disco Christmas music. So if you feel like finding these, you know, somebody's posted up all the holiday music they used to play at Kmart over the loudspeakers. Uh, you might enjoy this in the same vein. Well, here we are the Magnificent Mile in downtown Chicago. Behind me is the Salvation Army. And as you can see, the holiday season is permeating the air, not unlike the stench of urine that permeates at the other 11 months of the year. So now I think we're going to go uh, see if some little kids want to talk to me as Santa. What do you want for Christmas, little girl? How about Alexis? Alexis, what color? Black. Silver. Black. Black. Black is a two-week waiting period, but I'll see what I can do. Silver? Silver, I can put you in a silver Lexus right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Now let's, let's talk financing. Santa, uh, Santa, Santa. Santa, 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 Santa Claus, Claus. Oh my God, what's happened to her? This must be the work of Goldfinger. What would you like for Christmas? A cell phone. A what? Cell phone. A cell phone. How old are you? No, I'm 16. Well, didn't you want a new car by now? No, uh, my parents gave me a car. My goodness. Well, someone's a spoiled little 16-year-old. <laughs> And now she wants a cell phone. Well, have a good Christmas, and I'll see what I can do. At least enjoy me on an ironic level. Merry Christmas. That's false advertising. They want to see Santa, not some freak who's been put up to this by his friends who think it's funny. Meaning me. Hey, would you like to talk hey, to Santa? No, you have to do it in your elf voice. Oh elf. Listen, you, <laughs> you do this in your elf voice, or we are going home right now. Freeze it. Talk in your elf voice. Come on, kids, come see Santa! <laughs> Very good. Get some little children, drop all the elf or you're fired. Hey, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle on his way. Santa's Claus is born as on bed with his sleigh. Hey, jingle bells, Santa Claus, something Santa Claus. He's a bit of a... So morning Christ was born. <laughs> New on Columbia Records and Tapes. The Heartbreak Kid turns 50 this year, and it came out December 17th, 1972, but it's kind of a lost film today. So from what I've pieced together, the movie was made by something called Palomar Pictures, which started as a subsidiary of ABC Television, and then in 1970, that company was bought by Bristol Myers Squibb. That's the company that makes Abilify and lots of other drugs, because back then, diversifying was the craze for big corporations. So over the next few years, they made The Taking of Pelham 123, The Stepford Wives, 
They shoot horses, don't they? Take the Money and Run, Sleuth, and of course, The Heartbreak Kid. Most of those films are available again today because the rights were transferred because a studio stepped in or the star stepped in to reclaim them or there was a modern remake and so you can find them on DVD or on streaming. But The Heartbreak Kid is not so lucky. According to this article, at this point, no one seems to have any idea who would even sign off on getting this film reissued properly. Uh, although it was remade in 2007, you know, the movie in general was just terrible. So for the original film of The Heartbreak Kid, it's been released on VHS and Betamax and Laserdisc. That was in the 80s. And then in 1998, it came out on DVD. That was full frame from Anchor Bay. And then they also put out a widescreen in 2002, and that was it. Those go for big bucks today. They're not available through Netflix as the discs. Uh, it's not streaming anywhere. I found a full-frame DVD through our local library, and they had one copy within the entire 22-county area. It's a very big library system, and that's all they had. So the only way to really see this movie any more easily is on YouTube. And I think this is sourced from the widescreen DVD, uh, but then it's cropped in a bit. So here's some examples of how the different versions look. Uh, I married her because I thought it was... the. Okay, this is recorded right off the screen, so forgive the uh, screen artifacts. This is a mid-90s Sony monitor. This is the full-frame DVD. So I'm I'm going to get out. This is the same disc on an older, late 70s Sony monitor. And again, you'll notice that Eddie Albert, especially on the left side of the screen, a lot of him is cut off. Those are my cards. And... Uh, Mr. Corcoran, there's, there's, there's not a joker in the bunch. Okay, this is the same disc piped into my laptop, I mean, uh, and you'll see on the left you get a lot more information, and Eddie Albert is barely well, chopped like, off. Like uh, it also about, seems like at the top and bottom you get a little bit more information. How you feel about what I've said, and uh, to ask if I have your approval. Not if they tied me to a horse and pulled me 40 miles by my tongue. Well, that's, that's an honest answer, sir. And now this is the version that's on YouTube currently. A uh, little bit better color, not quite as sharp, and even though it's not cut off so much on the sides, at the top and bottom, it seems to be cut off more. But this is going to be the best trade-off because it's probably the easiest one to find for most people. I don't like one goddamn thing about you. Uh, well, uh, initial judgments very often are misleading. See, I found that out to, to, to my... Uh, Sorrow, sir. So it looks like YouTube is your best option until somebody shows this film the respect that it deserves and puts out a proper widescreen, high-resolution transfer. And by the way, the original Sleuth from 1972, uh, it falls into the same boat, even though it also had a remake. The only way to really see it right now is on YouTube. So check it out while you can. Howard Johnson, Howard Johnson, Under the orange roof at Howard Johnson's, kids have more to be hungry for, more to be thirsty for, sleepy for, happy for.
KK, what do you think of all this? They're very inspirational. Is that good? No. This is the one thing KK likes, this. He wants one in his room. Everything else, it's not so orange. exciting. It's orange. I just find it so intriguing that I can go in and I can find the drawings. I could, you know, the s studies for a metal foil tree and the costs and the heights and the mathematical equations to build these. And then this here was a traffic study that showed in, the ni in 1949 to 1950 the traffic and the cars that came through the park that year. So for some reason, they really wanted to come through yeah. um, on, well, weekends. Sundays. Yes. Yeah, definitely Sundays. Nice. Yeah. Um, but just, like I said, and every year either has, like I said, just the detail. This is all early 50s, late 40s, pre-computer. Right. Mm -hmm. Cost progress report. Right. Are we allowed to see how much it cost back then? Um, $5,000 maybe. Wow. All told, 5000 Yeah, probably about five. Electrician hours, they were $2.20. $2.20 for an electrician back then. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That was kind of and that's from 19. Oh, plans from 1950. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Looks like this one of the seven. Ooh. No, that's Santa. That's it. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And what's interesting is these eras, they took photographs, but as it got a little bit later, then we had our slides and VCR tapes, and now it's all on one DVD or a thumb drive. <laughs> so there aren't these folders and folders as you get to the later years.